everyone, and welcome back to another episode of What the Forensics. My name is Journey, and I am joined here today by the lovely Nicole and Rebecca. This week, Rebecca will be telling us all about the case of Yang Jinhai, and Nicole will be educating us on the science of forensic traumatology and how it played an instrumental role in this case. I'm really excited to hear what Nicole has about forensic traumatology because I signed up for a course um, that was centered around forensic traumatology, but I never actually finished it. So I'm excited to learn and especially uh, learn about Yang Jinhai because we've uh, talked about him a lot just between the three of us and apparently it's quite brutal. So with that being said, there is a listener's discretion advised as there are descriptions of sexual assault, child death, and murder. And with that, I will pass it over to Rebecca. Thank you, Journey. Um, So to get started, we're going to go a little bit into the childhood that we know that he had. Um, Because this all occurred in China, there actually isn't like a lot of information about like his personal life and the crimes themselves and all that. But I have compiled as much information as I can find that's as accurate as possible. There were some resources that like were a little iffy, so I kind of tried to stray away from those. Uh, but yeah, so to begin, Yang Jinghai was born the youngest of four children in um, Henan province, China, on July 17th of 1968. That is already the first um, thing that is debated by people. Some people say he was born July 17th, some July 26th, but either way, he was born sometime around July 1968. And before continuing, I also want to note that although he is most commonly known kind of in the media as Yang Jinhai, he also had multiple aliases, uh, which included Yang uh, Jia and Yang Lu. I'm going to refer to him as Jing Hai in this episode because it's what most of the sources say. Um, but it is possible that his actual legal birth name was, in fact, Yang uh, Jia. So according to every source I read, it was known that Jin Hai was born into one of the poorest families in his village in Henan province. Uh, there was about 2,000 families in this province, and they were uh, some of the most economically um, underprivileged, I guess you could say. Um But both of his parents, despite this, worked very long and hard hours to provide for their family and try to give them the best upbringing they could. So growing up, Jin Hai was described by many as very intelligent, but also very introverted as he struggled to make friends when he was in grade school. Jin Hai did very well in early grade school, um, so much so that despite his parents' financial troubles, they borrowed money in order to pay for him to go to high school so that he could further his education and hopefully kind of get out of their family's socioeconomic situation. However, Jin Hai was not at all interested in school, and this was partially because he was bullied by his peers for having a smaller stature and being quiet, and this ultimately led to him dropping out when he was just 17 in 1985. So after dropping out of school, Jin Hai left home and refused to return. Instead, he traveled around China working multiple jobs as he went, and this was mostly just working as a general laborer, so on farms and factories, just wherever he could find work. And while traveling the country, Jin Hai ran into his first trouble with the law after being arrested for a series of thefts uh, in multiple provinces, and he was sentenced to spend some time in a re-education labor camp in 1988. I was unable to find how long he spent in these labor camps. However, it could not have been any longer than three years, as um, once again, in 1991, he was sentenced to spend more time in labor camps, again because of theft. And again, there's limited information on how long he spent there, but we know that it was no longer than five years because he was arrested again in 1996, Um, But this time it was not for theft. It was for a more serious crime of attempted sexual assault in Zhumadian, China. I'm really hoping I pronounced that correctly. I apologize if I didn't. Um, But for this crime, he was sentenced to five years in prison. So for sexual assault or attempted. However, for some reason, he was still released a year early in 1999. And it was after his release in 1999 uh, when his crimes very quickly and very violently progressed. 
So I'm not terribly sure how accurate this next point is that I'm about to say about his girlfriend as sources really varied when it came to personal details of his life. Um, And as you know, the media really loves to speculate on MOs and like purpose for why people did what they did. But apparently he started dating a girl in 1992, which would suggest he got out of prison before 91 for thievery, but we don't know. Um, however, after his uh, charge for attempted sexual assault, she ultimately broke up with him justly, I think. Um, and then some people speculate that this breakup is what ultimately led to Jin Hai developing a really vengeful attitude towards society. Um, however, as I said, this is all speculation as Jin Hai never publicly stated these things or he never, he never confirmed or denied them. And honestly, accurate information regarding the dates and details of all of Jin Hai's crimes have been hard to come by as most sources emphasize the dates in which he committed mass murder um, and sources vary as the date of his first one. It is widely believed, um, and this is likely because of the confession he provided to police, that the first murder he committed occurred in 1999. This hasn't been corroborated. However, sources say that his crime spree lasted from 1999 to 2002. So I'm speculating a little bit here. Um, But to get into kind of the details we do know about his future crimes... September 19th of 2000 was the date in which Zinhai murdered two people within the same day. And this would have been also the first that they actually kind of made a note that this is when his crime spree truly started. So at the time of his killing spree, Zinhai was still traveling around China uh, and primarily to more rural areas that were outside of the large populated cities. And these areas he traveled to were often populated with farms and farmers and their families. And it is noted that most of Jin Hai's victims were actually farmers and their families on their own farmland. So in order to keep police off of his trail, it was noted that Jin Hai always made sure to wear different clothing to every crime scene and also wore shoes that were a couple sizes too big for him so that the police couldn't connect his foot size to the crimes. And further, he didn't have one specific mode of killing, uh, as we often see with serial killers. Um, However, he was known to basically just use whatever tools that he found on these family farms. And this included mostly his crimes were committed with axes, hammers, shovels, and knives to bludgeon or stab his victims. So it seems that the most common method of murder for Jin Hai was to sneak into people's homes at night when everyone was sleeping or supposedly asleep, and he would then kill everybody within the household. And to emphasize this, Jin Hai truly does not seem to have cared about who he was killing, as on multiple occasions, he killed entire families, including children as young as like five years old and old like seniors and grandparents. Wow. That's not good. (laughs) Nope, not at all. (laughs) That kind of felt like an understatement. (laughs) (laughs) Did he go out of his way to find households with multiple people or was it just that's how it happened? As far as we know, that's just kind of how it happened. He just he saw an opportunity on like a, a remote farm and just hoped someone was inside, basically. Interesting. And he didn't want to leave or witnesses, so has to get rid of everybody, I suppose. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's also weird or, like, interesting that he had the forethought to wear different clothes for every crime and that to wear shoes that were just too big so that they couldn't uh, figure out what size his feet were. I feel like most criminals, though, they know, like, they don't actively choose to wear different clothes, but it just happens that they're wearing different clothes. Like, I feel like most serial killers aren't going to be like, yes, I'm going to wear my favorite shirt to all of these. Like, Mm -hmm. it just kind of is second nature for different clothes, but, like, for him to actively choose and say, like, I need to wear different clothes and larger shoes, it's interesting. Yeah, Mm -hmm. for sure. I I definitely understand, like, the clothing thing maybe not being that weird, but, like, the forethought to wear shoes too big, like, would definitely be, like, a conscious decision. Yeah, yeah very much so. 
Um, but if committing mass murder on multiple entire families was not enough to have you shocked, uh, Jinhai also unfortunately sexually assaulted many of his female victims before killing them as well. So this would have... I didn't see anything about him doing this to children, which is slightly better. Um, but he did sexually assault multiple wives or if there was adult women in the house, including one woman that was pregnant at one point and she survived. But if I remember correctly, ended up passing away 10 days later due to her injuries. And at the same wow. crime scene, her husband and her six-year-old daughter were also murdered. That's devastating. I know. Um, so he killed between one and five people at a time. Um, and Jinhai was actually caught in a way in which I very much did not expect. Um, I fully believed there would have been like a full manhunt kind of searching for him. It'd be all over the media. Look for this man. But the fact is they actually kind of found him by accident. So police were conducting a routine inspection of various entertainment venues in uh, Kanzhou, Hebei province on November 3rd of 2002. So a day before my second birthday. <laughs> And uh, Jin Hai happened to be at one of the venues that they were inspecting. Couldn't find whether or not he was employed there as a laborer or if he was just simply visiting the venue because it's an entertainment venue. Um, however, apparently when police were doing this inspection, they noticed Jin Hai because they felt that he was acting really suspiciously. And because of this, they detained him just kind of to see what's going on. And then upon collecting his information, they discovered that there were active arrest warrants out in four other provinces uh, for in connection to these multiple murders. So Jinhai's crimes spanned across four provinces in China, which were Anhui, uh, Hebei, Henan, and Shandong, which were also the provinces that he had the arrest warrants in. Of course, that was a little redundant, but you know... <laughs> I didn't know that there were provinces in China. I knew there was a couple. I didn't realize there were so many. Mm -hmm. Do you know how many there are? Or is there only four? There there's a lot. Is, there's a lot. I, was, okay. I didn't end up looking for the specific number, but still, being wanted in four provinces, that's like being wanted in four provinces in Canada. Like, that's excessive. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. There okay, wow. are 22 provinces administered by China and one province that's claimed but not administered, which is Taiwan. Don't know what that oh, means, okay. but it sounds oh, like there's 22 yeah. provinces. Wild. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, Taiwan is a free state, but China just doesn't want to admit that they're their own <laughs> governing country. And it's, it's, a big, it's, it's a big political problem right now. <laughs> All right, yes. fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so police thought he was suspicious, detained him, realized he was out on multiple arrest warrants. And of course, because of this, they arrested him. So in total, Jin Hai had committed crimes in 26 separate incidences. So this basically means that every one of his murders, sexually assaults, everything occurred on just 26 separate days between 1999 and 2002. And in this time, he killed 67 people. He committed 23 sexual assaults and caused serious injury to 10 other people. And for the people who survived his brutal attacks, they were often left without a family as many of the people who survived were targeted as like with their whole family and many of the deceased families were unfortunately actually found by other family members that either didn't live in the same house or were just not at home when the crimes had occurred and police officials refused to make many comments on Jin Hai's case um, they stated that they received an order from the Ministry of Public Security not to speak to the media so what we know of this case is largely what officials were allowed to share with us and also what inmates that interacted with him in prison had claimed that he told them so uh, Jin Hai 
was taken into police custody on November 3rd of 2002 after being detained. And it is reportedly sometime shortly after this that police confronted him with the crimes that he was accused of. And he just apparently then and there, because we don't have any information about the interrogation, um, he openly confessed to all of his crimes. So police took a DNA sample from him and they were able to connect the DNA to multiple crime scenes. So this, in addition to his confession, made like for a pretty solid case. Jinhai's court case was done behind closed doors without media. However, during the initial proceeding, apparently Jinhai refused to appeal the case, which to my understanding just means that he's pleading guilty. And... So because of this, apparently the court proceeding only lasted one hour. And in this time, he was sentenced to be executed by a firing squad. And it is not known whether or not any of his family or victims' families attended the proceeding. But apparently um, his father did speak to the media at one point and did say that after Jinhai left um, their town at 17 and left home and didn't come back, he really didn't come back. I believe his father said between the ages of 17 and him being apprehended, he'd only seen him twice. Holy cow. I know. So he just totally like up and ran away. Yeah. I wonder why. I wonder that too, because everything I read about his childhood, which mind you, there wasn't a lot, but what I did read besides being like a bit bullied in school and being from like a poor family, he like, it doesn't appear that he suffered any abuse. He was apparently a very smart kid. His parents treated him very well. He just, there was just something about him, I guess. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So um, to continue, I'm unsure if it was during his confession or during his court proceeding, but when asked about why he did what he did, officials say that he's quoted saying, quote, when I killed people, I had a desire. This inspired me to kill more. I don't care whether society or sorry, I don't care whether they deserve to live or not. It is none of my concern. I have no desire to be a part of society. Society is not my concern, unquote. That's messed up. Yeah, he just he just it, it seems like he just killed for thrill, almost like he was addicted mm-hmm. to it. Yeah. Not to be like that person, but if he was had wanted no part of society, why wouldn't he just take his own life? You know what I mean? Like, if he was so against it at that point, like, would it have been easier for him to do that than to murder 64 people or however many? I definitely think it would have been easier on everybody else. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. That happened. That's fair. (laughs) But I don't know. I think a man like this has to have something seriously wrong with him to do what Mm -hmm. he does. If he doesn't care about society, like, I really wish there was more details about this case and about his psychology and stuff, because I want to know more, but (laughs) all all of the sources say the same thing or an iteration of the same details. Weird. Yeah. It's just like, even saying like, I don't care whether they deserve to live or not. Like that's so cold. Yeah. I know. Well, he killed kids and grandparents like Mm -hmm. within the same day. Like he, I was reading reports from when it happened and they said like he literally eliminated families, like multiple yeah. generational families. And wow. see, that makes me think that something did happen in his childhood because no regular person yeah. just starts annihilating families. Yeah. yeah. For and sure. Like, I feel like most, most serial killers, when they start killing, they it's like one person and then they kind of escalate up to that. They don't mm-hmm. just start with, like you said, annihilating families. Yeah. Yeah. That's like crazy. The, yeah, it's honestly unbelievable. Like most of researching this just left me speechless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, but while he was awaiting his execution in a detention center, he was reportedly asked by multiple inmates why he killed so many people. And to this, he replied, quote, killing people is very usual. Nothing special, unquote. Oh. I think... I, like he's just acting like this is just another part of his job this is just yeah. what he does 
I would like to argue that killing people is very usual and nothing special because you are taking away someone's life and that should always be, yeah, I don't know, important. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure the people who lost their families felt that it was important. Yeah. <laughs> right? Like how yeah. disconnected from absolutely everything do you have to be to make a claim like that? Like a, yeah. yeah, just killing families. No biggie. No like, biggie. What? It's a regular Tuesday for me. Yeah. I don't know why you're mad about it. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the hell? Yeah, it's oh, it's really something. That's all I have for it. But yeah. um, Jinhai was ultimately executed by firing squad on February 14th of 2004. And prior to being apprehended, when people didn't know who the perpetrator of all the killings was, um, he was dubbed the monster killer because of how brutal and seemingly random his crimes were. And while this man did pose a significant threat to people living in areas that he was running around because, like, he had he didn't appear to have any motive at all, there was actually very little news shared about the crimes as they were occurring, um, which left people feeling both very fearful for their safety, but also might have left them unaware of just how dangerous he actually was until new news began to be released after his arrest. But I read from the BBC, uh, like after all this came out, and it was, I don't know if they were saying this to be like snarky against Chinese media, um, but they did say something about like, they didn't report on these crimes because they don't want to believe that China has the same violent tendencies as the Western countries. And that just felt like a little harsh to say. Yeah. But I mean, I, I I can't really speak on that because I really I don't know how exactly <laughs> how chi China's media operates. I know it's different than ours, but I can't <laughs> comment on that. <laughs> um. It does Wasn't seem weird, it? though, that, like, there was nothing published about it while it was happening. Absolutely. Yeah. And were if there like, was, it's... Sorry. I was just saying, oh, weren't these, good. like, super rural places, though? Like, I can kind of understand a lack of media attention if it's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, I'm not but positive I'm exactly where all of the provinces are located, but okay. I can... After the episode, I can put just together a little like map that shows the provinces and I'll okay. put it in the sources. But um, I do remember reading that one of the towns that he was committing crimes was only about three hours away from Beijing. Oh, OK. So not incredibly rural. Yeah, like rural enough to be farmland, but not like a full day's drive from your local major city. Yeah. OK. Right. But um, hmm. that is all I have on Jin Hai, and it seems that that is all anyone else has on Jin Hai. <laughs> um, like I said earlier, like there was a few sources that I found that I was like, oh, that's a new detail. But then like reading a bunch of other sources that are all the same, and then this one source, I noticed like three discrepancies. So I was like, mm, I don't think I can include stuff from this because I <laughs> now don't really trust it. <laughs> yeah. But that's so, yeah. Yeah. But that's what I could find. Do we know if firing squad executions are like still a thing in China or elsewhere? I'm pretty sure they still are. Um, um, I think in the States there was talk about bringing them back. There was oh. because there was a shortage of... Um, uh, lethal injection medications and so they were butchering a lot of them so a couple states kind of threw out the idea that maybe we should bring it back but obviously <laughs> there was a lot of backlash yeah, yeah. and then i think why. we talked about someone who was like the last lethal injection or no firing squad or something or last guillotine maybe yeah something like that we talked about someone who was the last something or other and <laughs> That's a lot of... It gets mixed up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so apparently China does still... Since 1940... And this is just Wikipedia. But since 1949, the most common method of execution in China is by firing squad. Interesting. Really? Hmm. Which has been largely superseded by lethal injection. But it seems that it is 
it is still a thing. And so are execution vans where they just pull up to someone's house in a van and shoot them and drive away. That's just called a drive by shooting. (laughs) (laughs) It's legal. Like, can you imagine a gang? Yeah, could you imagine a gang being like, no, this wasn't a drive by shooting. We were driving an execution van. It's actually perfectly legal. (laughs) Yeah, that's no. It doesn't even sound any better, too. Like an execution van. Like, it almost sounds worse, to be honest. (laughs) Like, I don't want to know what's inside that van. (laughs) Well, and how do you know you got the right person? Ooh, yeah. Right? I've actually like, heard stories about issues with it, but I I didn't hear enough to accurately say anything about it. But yeah. maybe I'll do some research and, and fill you guys in. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, we'll do an episode on, like, execution vans or, like... <laughs> Modes of execution. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that, could be, that could be interesting, actually. That would be a cool actually, episode. Be a fun episode. Well, yeah, I'm actually... I'm reading a book right now called uh, The Tale of Two Murders, and it goes a lot about into, like, executions and, like, innocence and guilt via, like, hanged executions. So that could be very interesting. That does sound very good. Uh Uh-huh. Do you know what I also learned? I haven't, like, delved into researching it, so this could be completely false, so don't take my word for it. But apparently... (laughs) um, When people were burned at the stake, I always thought they were just, like, put up there, fire was lit, whatever. But apparently there was someone behind them that would pull a rope taut around their neck to basically get them to pass out before they were burned. So they didn't actually have to, like, burn alive or be conscious while they were burning. Yeah. I don't know if this was, like for all cases because i can't expect them to have done that for the salem witch trials and like all Mm -hmm. of those people they burned alive but like from my understanding that was like a common practice at some time in whenever in history huh well i I mean i guess that is slightly more humane (laughs) so slightly Interesting. Oh my gosh. Fun fact of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. Um, yeah, well, thank you, Rebecca, for telling us about Yang Jinhai and his um nefarious activities. He seems like not a very nice guy. And so thank you for finding as much as you could about him. It's still weird that there wasn't much known and that his trial wasn't um published and so that you can access it, but I guess especially, really- sorry, I have one more comment about it. Especially, like, the lack of information is surprising given it's still considered one of the, gr- like, most gruesome and brutal serial killers in all of, like, China. Really? Wow. Yeah. I think, though, like, the censorship in China is very, very different than, like, what we're used to. Or so even just, like, super unsurprising. Yeah, how courthouses, like, because it's, like, some of ours, like, we have, like, the anti-publication laws or whatever Mm -hmm. if um a trial gets that but everything else is public so it could just be different in china absolutely and they did say that this this case in particular was done behind closed doors no media so it seems like it's just the same thing as a publication ban here Mm -hmm. yeah so if anyone's familiar with chinese law uh please reach out we would love to know (laughs) yeah Yeah. and uh with that being said nicole do you want to tell us a little bit about forensic traumatology Yes, I would love to. Um, I do want to preface and say that this will not be an exhaustive list or discussion about traumatology. Um, And this is just because like traumatology is kind of just a catch all term, in my opinion, like it encompasses a lot of things. Um, And, you know, with it being a podcast, we don't have all of the time in the world. So I just wanted to kind of pick and choose what I thought would be the most relevant and interesting things um, for this case. But the term traumatology means the study of injury, but it doesn't really quite specify what type of injury. So you have on one side, like the psychological and emotional traumas that people face. And then that results in like forensic or not forensic, sorry, psychological traumatology. And so these are like cases of PTSD and extreme um, disorders like that. 
And then you have physical medicine side, though, where traumatology would be looking at physical injuries that the body can sustain. So medical traumatology often deals with the treatment of wounds and injuries that can be caused either by accident or by violence. And the important thing to note, though, in... um, is medical traumatology and, oh, sorry, medical trauma and psychological trauma aren't always separate entities. Um, They can be, but a lot of the times they go hand in hand with one another. So if you suffer from some terrible physical trauma that results in like a long, complicated healing journey, maybe, um, this poses the possibility of leading to psychological trauma. So the two can coincide and people often suffer or can suffer from both um, physical and psychological traumas from the same injury or from the same event. To kind of loop it back into forensics in this episode, though, I'm going to go more into the medical legal branch and um, medical traumatology and talk about injuries to the body. And it may sound kind of like a pathology lesson, Um But I'm going to try and limit the amount of super technical jargon I use because there can be a lot and it just gets boring if all we do is drone on about dictionary words. Um, But that being said, if any of you guys do want to learn about kind of like the histology and the microscopic aspects of traumatology and um, pathology, let us know and we can definitely delve further into that. Um, I think, yeah, Journey, you took the course. I don't know if you took it, Rebecca, but we took like a whole forensic human anatomy and trauma, I guess, course where we learned all about everything of the body. So is that the one we had to write the essay on like any autopsy report that we wanted? Uh, I didn't do that one. I remember I think you've done that, though, Journey. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I did that one. And then, I don't know you if you showed one- changed it though um the one where we had to do a presentation on a way to kill someone oh i didn't do that but that sounds fun (laughs) (laughs) maybe that was just your special class (laughs) lucky me (laughs) okay well if anyone wants to hear my presentation (laughs) send me a message (laughs) Didn't you do embolism? What was it? Embolism? Mm-hmm. Emboli- is yeah, that I did a, like an air embolism. Yeah. Okay. Because they're oh, fascinating. Oh, I remember that now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, okay, what class are you thinking of, Nicole? I have no memory of it. I have like all of your notes from it. Um, Michelle's forensic <laughs> human anatomy course. <laughs> I think I do remember oh, yeah. that. Like it was like we learned about uh, like flesh wounds one week and then we learned about like like the skeletal system like yeah all that jazz yeah yeah okay. so like, like she super rushed yeah she delved into like literally every system in your body and like the histology of it and how it functions and then they that would be tied into um traumas and how those systems can be affected in like a forensic setting right i'm re- i remember now yeah okay yeah. it's it's really I, well. yeah Okay, yeah, it is. <laughs> I want to find my notebook from that class because it was beautiful. <laughs> um, but yes, long story short, we all did a course like that. So if you want to learn more about kind of the inner workings of the body and anatomy and all of that fun stuff, let us know because I'm sure we would all geek out over that. But jumping right into things, um, injuries can be classified by two different properties and those being anatomical or functional. So anatomical injuries are what generally comes to mind for most of us when we hear the term injury. And these are your wounds, your scratches, bone breaks, really any damage that your body can suffer. And then functional injuries are those that like I personally would say vary from person to person. And these would consist of things of like the pain that we feel when we sustain an injury. If we are in a state of shock, that kind of thing. So I will cover basically just the anatomical um, side of things. And I will preface and say, while not super scientific and jargony, there 
is still going to be terms thrown at you because you it's inevitable. You're just going to have to deal with it. I'm so sorry. Um, but hear me out. In an investigation, interpretation and classification of injuries are really important in gaining an insight and understanding as to what happened in that case. So terminology is especially imperative when it comes to medical traumatology, because if you're, say you're pathologist or a medical examiner, you're writing up a report of this homicide. If you're describing a large wound caused by an axe and you're saying that, you know, there is a slash mark, that's just completely wrong and can just confuse a whole lot of people. Um, And it's just very much painting an incorrect image of what happened to this victim. And that's not what we want in the field. So terminology is really critical in that aspect. And so by accurately noting and detailing injury seen, a system can then be created that allows practitioners to effectively and efficiently record and describe what is being seen. Um, And that being done allows others reading their reports to know what's going on and what happened. And so injuries can be caused by by a plethora of means, but the more common trauma seen that I'll go over are blunt force trauma and sharp force trauma. And those can be seen in um, the given case here with Yang Jinhai, especially sharp force trauma. Um, So listen in when I talk about that because it's important. Um, But blunt blunt force trauma is the most common type seen um, almost in all medical legal contexts where there's injuries present, whether it is from an accident or if it was purposeful. And essentially, it's when one object hits another, often a body. And since it's a term to describe the general mechanism of injury, it's pretty well anything that hits you that doesn't have a sharp edge or point. And at that point, it becomes sharp force trauma. Um, So this means that blunt force trauma can be caused by objects with a flat surface. So like the floor or a tabletop with a cylindrical surface. So think of like pipes or baseball bats. Um, table corners, by cars, um, the list goes on. Name something and it's most likely blunt force trauma if it does not have an edge to it, a sharp edge. But injuries that fall under blunt force trauma include, but aren't limited to, abrasions, bruises and or contusions, lacerations, and bone damage, such as fractures or dislocation. And so when I mentioned the importance of terminology, this is kind of where it comes into play um, because there are so many ways of describing kind of the same thing generally. So abrasions are typically superficial injuries to the skin, also known as grazes or scrapes. And the direction of movement can actually sometimes be determined. And this is by observing small pieces of skin at the wound's edge, which would have been last in contact with the surface that caused that wound. So they described it as skin tags. But when I think of skin tags, I think of like big, chunky skin tags that people like freeze off or like, you know what I mean? You, like that's what you yeah. see. Do you remember I, those, like, TV commercials with, like, for st- skin tag things? Yeah. Like yeah. the little yeah, the elastics. infomercials. Mm-hmm. Like the elastics that you would put around, and it basically kills off the skin tag, and it falls Ew. off. Yeah. Bro, yeah. I remember yeah. those. Like they're, like, early 2000s infomercials. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so those aren't the type of skin tags in abrasions. They're, like, just, like, I guess if you – I'm trying to think of an example – like, okay, so when I was really young, I fell out of a tree and I scraped my back all along a brick wall. And like on the top end of it, you had like little bits of skin. It sounds really gross, but like, I don't know how else to describe it. Would you, you know say like it? a skin flap? Like Not f- as like- large as a flap, but it's kind of like, um, oh, you know when like your Lululemon leggings pill and you get mm-hmm. clothing that pills? It's kind of like that, but with skin weird <laughs> interesting if that makes I sense didn't know so, like, that happened it kind of not to the extent of pilling but that's kind of like the same concept of like your skin is kind of pushed in one direction and like you kind of get that rolling of it and then the little taggies to show you the direction 
wild i have no idea what you're talking about i think i think that actually happened to me the other day so i think i know what you're talking about i ran into one of my cabinet like my drawer handles and gashed my leg open and i think i know exactly what you're talking about like (laughs) you can kind of see like the skin being pushed in a direction and that's kind of just where it ends up anyways that's an abrasion (laughs) Um, okay (laughs) yeah um so those are abrasions and when recording it or like making observations in kind of a pathological or pathology sense is that where the term super unrelated is that where the term pathological comes from like pathological liars the pathology of your brain and why you lie i would i want to say yes okay i anyway super unrelated but that just dawned on me light bulb went off um (laughs) but if you are a pathologist and are recording wounds it's important to note size orientation and the depth of your abrasion the most common type of abrasion is a graze abrasion and this is caused by dragging against something so like a larger example of this would be road rash so if you were to be on your motorcycle you fall and you like obviously the road's not moving and you're moving across the road you're going to get that road rash and abrasion in the direction you're moving if that makes sense um there are also impact abrasions which are often caused when large amounts of force are applied perpendicularly to the skin for a short period of time so some examples of this would be like being run over by a car or getting in a car accident and having the seatbelt lock and then that causing an injury to your chest or your lower abdomen. Um, so it's just like a very quick impact of something. But then there are also patterned abrasions. And these are when you come into contact with something forcefully and then that object's pattern is reproduced and seen on the skin. So if you say like, were to be thrown against or assaulted over a metal grid. So I always think of like those subway grids um, on the sidewalk. If say you were thrown against that, you may then have kind of that hash marking reproduced on your skin. And so that would be a patterned abrasion. Um If it's a distinctive pattern, this can actually provide investigators and pathologists with an idea um, of circumstances around the event and what happened. But next, there are bruises. Sorry, did you want to say something? I was just going to say, like, if you get run over by a car, then the tire print is like... Yeah. yeah, That would be like a patterned abrasion. Yeah. Okay. And then that would Um, let investigators know you got run over by a car yeah i mean like i'm sure they would be able to clue in prior to the pattern (laughs) abrasion that maybe you got run over by a car but it would definitely Mm -hmm. help their case um going forward with it with this could you have like a pattern abrasion if um like someone hits you with a weapon and there's like like you can figure out the brand of the weapon due to like the impression of it. Yeah. And like this is kind of where things get a bit complicated too because you can have multiple types of injuries at once. So like mm-hmm. say I was wearing a massive ring and I slapped you with it, you would get that like graze from it, but you may also get that patterned from the ring, but also right. bruising after the fact and maybe see that rings like stone or something like that okay yeah that makes sense um but yes like kind of going off of that um next are bruises and these are a result of damaged blood or damage to blood vessels sorry which have resulted in blood entering the adjacent tissue and so in terms of documentation and reports estimation on bruise age can be really really important because this can help kind of give a timeline of events. But that being said, bruising ages have been described by color changes. However, it doesn't always follow that. And that's the tricky thing. And I think like in all terms of medical aspects, like there's no one way of things. 
Yeah. Um, Because I kind of thought that um, trying to age a bruise is something people cannot actually do because every single person heals Mm -hmm. differently. So there Mm -hmm. can't really be a way to definitively say when that bruise was obtained. Yeah, which is def- – like, that was my assumption and what we learned in class. Um, I think prior to that, though, there was kind of just, like – there was kind of this generally accepted and agreed upon timeline of, like, discoloration and um, matching time frames for that. But, it, like, the things that can affect timing kind of outweigh the – coloration if that makes sense like there's so many variables that can affect it that there's kind of no point looking at the coloration and trying to accurately estimate age on that Mm -hmm. um that being said still gonna tell you the ages and the colors but keep in mind (laughs) that uh you can't use it as your like bible don't yeah yeah um but generally agreed upon that zero to two days, the injured area becomes swollen and tender, and you may see some red-blue discoloration. By day three to five, this changes to a more blue or purple color. Then by days five to seven, you get green, which I have to be honest, I've never had a green bruise. I don't know if that's common for other people, but... That's day five to seven. Days seven to, uh, sorry, seven to 10 is when you get a bit of a yellow coloration to it. And then moving on to days 10 to about two weeks, so 14 days, you'll get some brown aspects into your bruise. And then it's generally accepted that days 14 to 28 is when resolution occurs. And this is when your bruise is healed or it's like deemed to be healed. Um, That's so crazy that it takes 28 days for your bruise to heal. Cause I've never had a bruise last that long. No. no. Um, like, and, and I, I don't know if I just have never had a large enough bruise for it to mm-hmm. last that long, but like I'm consistently bruised mainly because I just don't know where I exist in the world. So I'm constantly <laughs> like hitting things and walking into things. Yeah. So, like I always have a bruise, but I've never had like a green bruise. I've never had a month long bruise. Like mm-hmm. it just kind of seems extreme. Yeah. Right. And like I, bruise like it takes a lot for me to bruise so I couldn't even imagine like if I had a bruise that lasted a month to heal how bad that would hurt yeah but like do you have the same pain for that whole month like the sources I read didn't really go into that but Mm -hmm. I can't imagine like that would be so sucky if you had a incredibly painful bruise for up to a month yeah no kidding um But yeah, so that's kind of like the coloration and the aging of it all. Um, And it's kind of easy, at least in my opinion, to see how this may not be the case for everyone um, for each of the bruises they get, just as we were kind of talking about. Um, So to start, like my interpretation of a blue purple color may vastly different from either like your um opinions or, or interpretation sorry both Rebecca and Journey like I may be colorblind compared to you guys like you, there's really no way in telling who's looking at it and what color they see I feel uh, like sorry to interrupt you okay. I feel like it also has something to do with like you know the thing I've I've looked up a lot trying to figure out like my right foundation shade and it's like if your veins yeah. appear blue you have cool color or cool yeah. toned skin if they're Sorry, if they're purple, you're olive toned or green, Mm -hmm. you're neutral, whatever. Like, I feel like it also has something to do with your skin tone. Yeah, exactly. And, um, like, that being said, too, like, with skin coloration, you there also then is that, like, light coloration. So if you're seeing a bruise in a sunny day versus at night, um, that's going to change your interpretation of that color. Um, and to kind of throw into the mix of all is that you can also observe multiple colors existing at the same time with the same bruise. Um, 
so I, I guess you're kind of just looking for that next color in the like progression of aging charts that they have to kind of guesstimate. Um, but on top of that, like the rate of color change can differ even within the same person. Um, and also depending on where the bruise is on the body. And I guess there's been cases where um, family members like get a bruise and le- lose a bruise within like a day. Whereas others just like are always bruised. So it's so hard to kind of determine what's what. Um But yeah, so the coloring of bruises is also critical when it comes to photographing them. And I had written that, especially in sexual assault cases, but I guess in really any forensic or medical legal sense, like if your victim is still alive and bruising was a very prominent aspect of the assault, like photographing them is definitely and of course should be done to document and keep that in record but I think what goes wrong is that in court it's not well I don't know I've never sat in on court so this who knows but like it should be told that the color you're seeing could be very different than the color actually on the bruise and I don't know if that's portrayed all the time um because the uh color shown on screen could be drastically different than the initial photo. And that could, again, be because of the skin color, could be because of the light that's in the area. Like, there's just so many variables when it comes to bruising and documenting it that it just gets kind of complicated. Um, Did you find anything about, like, lividity and bruising and how that can affect it? Because, like, if there was a bruise on a part of the body where the body was then resting on, so all the blood pooled there, would that yeah. impact how the bruise develops or like? Yeah. So you would have more blood um, flowing into those areas, which would greatly impact discoloration and sizing. And like, yeah, it's just one of those other variables that you get thrown in and you have no idea how that's going to affect it. And it changes for everyone. Right. <laughs> But in addition to color and age estimation, the dimensions of a bruise should also be recorded, which going back to like the whole lividity thing is like if you're having blood pool for a certain amount of time, that's going to be a much larger size than maybe the initial bruise that occurred antemortem. As well as this, though, any patterns or shapes observed. So kind of going back to that pattern abrasion, like if you were hit with something and that forms a bruise, you may be able to see that pattern um, as the bruise. But also in addition to any presence or absence of swelling. The term contusion, you may have heard me use bruises and or contusions at the very beginning of kind of my spiel. But the term contusion is used synonymously with bruise. Um, But the main difference is that a contusion is when you're describing bruising present in other surrounding tissues and organs. So it's not within that same localized blood pooling around that broken blood vessel. It's like on a grander scheme. At least that's from my understanding. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, But again, where terminology becomes like so important because if I were to say like, oh, I have a contusion on my arm and I walked into a door, like it's going to be very different than getting hit by a car and having that internal contusion. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah. So then this might be silly, but like bruises are more like external and then contusions are more like internal bruises, even though like a bruise is internal. Yeah, essentially. And I think that's where, where that distinction comes into play for like, the reports you know what i mean like okay. and that's where like if i were to say i had a contusion but it wasn't then that just confuses how uh, that's going to be interpreted it just sounds more like serious yeah like right? everyone gets bruises but when you have a contusion like that's an issue and honestly i always thought a contusion was like a skin wound like there was mm-hmm. blood outside of your body like i didn't I thought realize so too yeah and i didn't hmm. real. there was a lot of terminology that i thought very differently prior to reading or researching this um 
But yeah, I always thought contusions were like open wounds and that was like a big scary thing was, oh, they have a contusion. But mm-hmm. I guess it's just a big bruise. To put and it then shortly. isn't hematoma also bruise? Yeah, but I think that's okay. like a big, big bruise. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That big is bad bruising. <laughs> mm-hmm. I just looked up, sorry, I just looked up hematoma and the first thing that comes up is a link, My Health Alberta, and the first <laughs> sentence is, a hematoma is a bad bruise. Yeah. <laughs> That's the first <laughs> sentence. <laughs> they are not wrong. I will That's say That's amazing. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we kind of covered bruising, um, abrasions. I kind of Now I wanted to move on to lacerations. And these are full thickness skin wounds that result from blunt force trauma in which the skin is torn by crushing or shearing forces. Um, And within this general term of laceration, there are also split lacerations and stretch lacerations. So split lacerations are caused by a sudden compression between two hard objects while stretch lacerations are caused by the tissue being overstretched away from the point of contact. And the tricky thing in investigations and determining whether someone actually has a laceration comes down, or sorry, um, in determining if someone has a laceration or say like an incised wound um, comes down to its healing. So once the wound has been cleaned or closed, hopefully by a medical professional, the line between what a laceration is or was and what an incised wound was becomes very blurred. And um, I'll discuss incised wound. I'll discuss incised wounds in a second. Um, once I get to sharp force trauma, but apparently those are different things. And prior to this, I thought lacerations were wound like incised wounds. Like I always thought a laceration was like you were cut by something, but apparently it is not. So the more, you know, Wouldn't, um, yeah, that feels very weird. Right. But like, so it's not to say that the skin, the the skin's obviously injured and wounded, Mm -hmm. but it's the method and the force applied that causes that wound to classify it as a laceration or like sharp force trauma, if that makes sense. Interesting. Cause like the split laceration um, one of the guys on Bryce's crew had his f- fingers smashed between a joist and something else. And mm-hmm. so it exploded out the end. So that would have been a split laceration. Yeah. But that's not what I think of when I hear the word split La- laceration yeah. at all. Right. Okay. And I think too, like a split laceration is like if you get conked in the head with something, mm-hmm. you have that hard object hitting your skull, that's going to cause a laceration. It looks like a oh. cut, but that's going to be a laceration, not a sharp force trauma wound. Does that make sense, Oh, uh, <laughs> that's so interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Whoa. Okay. So even with like boxers and stuff, that's why they put like Vaseline on their eyebrows and stuff so they don't get that's lacerations. lacerations from con Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. And Do that's you have a an blunt example? force trauma, not a sharp force not trauma. Not a sharp force trauma. Yeah. Okay. And so then with stretch lacerations, I don't fully understand what that is. So from my understanding, that's like say you got pinned under a car. And, like, Mm -hmm. that car kind of moves, but you're still stuck. Like, that's moving your skin away from where it wants to be. And that's going to cause that ripping and laceration in that. Gross. Okay. (laughs) I don't like that. (laughs) Picture. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Just just a note for squeamish listeners. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. (laughs) If, If you don't want to see some pretty gruesome photos don't look up stra- stretch laceration example because yeah. i just did and i didn't Ooh. expect them to be this <laughs> okay well yeah. now i want to scar myself yeah like it's fascinating well, but it's not for the squeamish <laughs> yeah no so i'm definitely not gonna post like examples <laughs> your face journey mine <laughs> they're all censored Oh, what? <laughs> View image. Ew, what the? 
So a quick Google of like stretch laceration examples, if you want a better picture painted for you, um, an example would be like a laceration on your scalp when it hits something in an accident or bless you, Lewis, um, or a laceration due to kicks by like a hard boot, um, which would raise like a little skin flap. So like it's pushing your skin in the direction it should not be being pushed in wild yeah so and it gets okay. better from here like we just we just talk about <laughs> all the injuries in this episode fantastic all right i'll let you continue <laughs> um but yeah so kind of just going back to the importance of terminology and how like we all had that light bulb moment of realizing what a laceration actually is when you learn the definitions of it like we hear laceration all the time but without knowing the um nitty-gritty of it all you know that's kind of just lost on everyone um and before i jump into sharp force trauma i also wanted to kind of briefly touch on bone damage that can be caused by blunt force trauma and while i won't discuss absolutely everything because there are so many ways in which your bones can break and be affected um there's surprisingly a lot of different types of fractures that can exist. So I'll list them off. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of them all, but you have eight major types of fractures and these are transverse. I'm also not going to say fracture after every each eight of these because that's just going to get annoying. Um, but you have transverse, oblique, spiral, comminuted, common, comminuted, green stick, impacted traction or avulsion and then compression or crush fractures and yeah so i'm going to include a photo on our website showing the differences obviously not like real life examples yeah, just like that. a diagram kind of or like a, yeah. a sketch of each a sketch of how because each way it's quite fascinating to see like um impact fractures say like compared to a green stick and like green stick mm -hmm. i'll get into like yeah i won't spoil the fun actually just wait <laughs> Ooh, I'm wait list to that. um but yeah like you you then have like the pathology of fractures that help describe and characterize those scene um so again like i feel like traumatology and pathology is very much like a term within a term within a term within a term to describe one thing. <laughs> so it gets very confusing. Um, but you can have open or closed fractures where open fractures, also known as compound fractures, are when the bone breaks through the skin. So you're going to have that um, damage to the skin as well. And these are worse, be worse than closed fractures because you then have the um, added bonus of infection occurring so in a closed fracture as uh, as it sounds like these don't penetrate the skin at fracture point so you don't have to deal with the, that added step of healing like you just have to worry about the bone healing not the skin around it healing and the skin around it staying clean kind of thing um you then have complete fractures which are those that are clean breaks right through the bone um, or incomplete fractures, which are only slightly broken. So you're not going to get that full snap of a bone. And some examples of incomplete fractures are green stick fractures, which I just briefly mentioned. And these are commonly seen in children. And the, the easiest way to think about these, I always think of like green wood. Like if you have a very new tree and you try and snap a green branch it kind of like um what's the ter what's the word where it like splays it strays it what's it kind of like splinters a yeah. little bit mm -hmm. okay yeah. yes and then you don't get that full snap like you would like an older older stick or like a dried out stick so a green stick fracture is where the bone doesn't completely fracture like in half yeah. So a green okay. stick fracture is a, is within a term within a term of incomplete fractures. Oh, so okay. then the incomplete fractures are no are not fully broken and in two. 
like you can get fragments that splinter off, um, which is like a common muted f- fracture where there's two or where there's two or more fragments. Um, but the the bone itself is still mainly intact. Like you don't have yeah. that clear clear split. You just have kind of straying pieces. Right. Um, and then there's also butterfly fractures, which are very similar to comminuted, but these are when there's two fragments and then like a triangular third piece. Um, I have a question and I don't know if it makes sense, but do are green stick fractures more seen in children because the bones are a little bit more malleable? Did you say that already? I didn't say that, but that's why. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly okay. why. Um, I did say it was commonly seen in children, but did not expand further on that. Okay. Um, but yeah, that's exactly why. It's because your bone has more give to it when you're younger. Right. So full of nutrients and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll stop interrupting. Uh, no, no, no. I love the questions. It's so fun. I just um, love bones. They're so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Right? They which are why, super cool. Which is why I think we should just do like a bone episode. If our listeners like, want that, tell us. Because there's so much like the axial skeletal system, the like go into all of that fun stuff. It would mm-hmm. be very jargony, but for those interested, I think that would be cool. We could just start like a Patreon where we teach people these things <laughs> and we have like an anatomy <laughs> class where we just go into this. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Our underqualified teacher. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're super overqualified, actually. Ignore what I just said. So we basically have PhDs. Um, but I do want to shift gears now and discuss a bit about sharp force trauma. Um, and this kind of I'll talk about later. But Rebecca did mention that one of the common or seen um, – modes of killing i guess that yang shanghai did was using like axes or just like kind of farm tools that were around and that i would consider a sharp force trauma you can still have blunt force trauma and sharp force trauma at the same time which gets confusing i'll discuss that but um sharp force trauma is i would say mainly seen in this case um yeah, so like the difference between blunt force and sharp force trauma is the weapon or thing that was used to cause the injury, right? Essentially, yeah. So sharp okay. force trauma, you're going to have anything with a sharp edge or a point, um, whereas blunt force trauma, you remove that sharpness to it. Right. And it's a lot of like friction and movement between objects, whereas like sharp force is typically like one object – coming down or slicing or slashing all of those fun terms. Um, But yeah, so like these injuries, you'll often see a very clear and clean wound and wound edge um, compared to blunt force trauma. And then there's different types of tissue that can be impacted by sharp force trauma. So you're not just going to get like the top layer of your skin. You can get, down through that, through your skin, through muscle, maybe even hitting bone, that kind of thing. And then um, these are all caused by sharp instruments or weapons. And so some common objects that cause sharp force trauma injuries are hand tools. Um, So I have examples like a screwdriver um, for hand tools, but you can also have like farming tools, axes, scythes, like all of that fun stuff. But glass can cause sharp force trauma, arrows, scissors, knives, swords. If it's pointy, it's probably going to cause sharp force trauma. Um, But within sharp force trauma, you then have incised wounds, punctured or stab wounds, incised stab wounds, chopped wounds, and saw wounds. And we can thankfully gain quite a bit of knowledge and insight into the circumstances of the injury um, when looking at sharp force trauma. And these are things such as like whether a victim faced peri or anti-mortem trauma or whether they were subjected to post-mortem dismemberment, that kind of thing. Um, Another thing that we can tell by sharp force trauma injuries is whether the victim was attempting to defend themselves And so being able to observe the injury itself and possible marks left on the bone can give a lot of relevant information on, surprisingly, the assailant as well. Um, 
So the handedness of the attacker can sometimes be determined depending on the wound, the attacker's position relative to the victim during the assault, whether the wound was self-inflicted, and information about the motion and force of the blade can also be determined sometimes. But the tricky thing with um, the observation of sharp force trauma injuries, though, is that patterns can sometimes resemble those caused by sharp force traumas. So coming back to like the laceration and incised wound conversation that we had, um, they look similar. And oftentimes when healed, you're not going to know or that line's blurred, but they're two kind of separate, very different things. Um, another tricky thing with sharp force trauma is that it is an observation and comparative science. So there are just some issues around that. But that being said, there have been advancements in the field to help increase um, the site surrounding these or increase these observational findings and like how we're interpreting them. And so this includes the use of scanning electron microscopy, CT scanning, in addition to increased research into tools most commonly used in sharp force trauma. So like, I always think of um, bones when she, it's like first season or something like that. She's in South America and she's got a piece of clay and she's just whacking it with different types of knives to see what kind of pattern that blade or edge is going to cause on the bone. So science and um, experiments have been conducted for very common or the most common tools used um, or seen in sharp force trauma. And so we've got a general understanding of sharp force trauma, but similarly to blunt force trauma, there are various types of injuries that fall within this term. And so incised wounds are caused by objects with sharp edges, most commonly knives and broken glass. Um, But unfortunately, it is also kind of a general term. And it can kind of be synonymous with the word cut, like if you were to have a cut. But the word cut um, is often frowned upon in discussion and observations And this is where the term incise wound comes into play. Um, Cut is just very general and vague and does not provide a lot of information. Whereas incise wound kind of gives you a bit more to work with. And bear with me because the term incise wound is going to be said a lot in the next few sentences. But an incised wound to the palm of the hand is often indicative of defensive wound or sorry, defensive wounds. And then you have slashes, which are incised wounds, but they are longer than they are deep. But then you have stab wounds, which are incised wounds that are deeper than they are long. And these can be caused by a whole load of different pointed objects and instruments and weapons. Um, there are also point scratches, and these are another form of incised wound that are more superficial in nature. So they're often just seen on the outermost layer of your skin. And these um, are often caused by the tip of a sharp object moving across your skin. From my understanding, um, like fingernails could fall under this. Like if you have kind of like stiletto pointed fingernails and you're scratching someone, that's going to be an incised wound. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, you also have chop wounds, which, as Rebecca kind of mentioned, um, Yang Xinghai did happen to use axes. So this would be an example of that. And chop wounds do have characteristics of both sharp force trauma and blunt force trauma. Um And like I said, they're caused by axes or machetes, and they're often inflicted with more force than you would seen with your typical or standard sharp force trauma injury. Um, I know I just vocab vomited a lot of information there. Um, So if you do have any questions, let me know or let either of us know. Um, We would love to, like, don't hesitate to reach out. There's also a lot that I just didn't have time to touch on. So if you want to learn more, reach out again. And because of how large of a topic traumatology and pathology are, it's kind of really hard, like I said, to delve deep into every aspect of it. So this episode was definitely more of a 
higher level review, as high level as we can get, because we do enjoy talking and I enjoy talking. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) it uh, went on a little bit. But there is also so much more information that exists that we can 100% delve deeper into um, in the future. And, you know, if there is an interest, then that's something we may investigate further. Exactly. And we'll try and put photos or like images up on the website so that you guys can have visuals of each of these things. Um, Yeah. They will not be graphic in no. any nature. Just, just like so you guys medical are that. diagram, like what you would see mm-hmm. in your doctor's office kind of thing. Yeah. Well, awesome. Thank you for sharing, Nicole. That is so much fun. Um, I love talking about like traumatology and like the different kinds of injuries you can get and how you can tell them apart and all of the complexities within that. Yeah. Um, so that's sweet. And our next topic is Machine Gun Kelly and the Prohibition. And that actually comes out on our three-year anniversary. (laughs) And so I'm flying out to Halifax and we're going to record a person, which is so exciting. I will will say not the American musician Machine Gun Kelly. Mm -hmm. I will clarify that now. (laughs) Yes. Don't get your hopes up. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So we are very excited for that episode. Um, We're going to try and videotape it. So it'll be on YouTube as well. And it'll be the first time we've ever recorded in person. And crazy. For th- I know. And we've never done an in-person. Yeah, right? we lived in the same province when this started, but it was COVID, so we couldn't mm-hmm. do it in person. Yep. And then we all moved back to our respective provinces, and yep. Yep. here we are three years later still <laughs> still video chatting away our podcast. <laughs> yep. Yeah. So that is so exciting, and so look forward to that. Um... For an interesting, like, did you know thing, I think I'm going to ask if you guys knew that in, um, I don't know if it's specific to this um, people, but the Blackfoot um, Native Americans around Calgary area, um, I went to Head Smashed in Buffalo Jump on the weekend, and that was really interesting. And so I learned that their what I'm assuming is God, he was called Nappy. He created women and children first. Oh. And he was kind of like, you are now people. Wow. And there was no talk about like how man was created. Go women. I know, which is so different from like the traditional Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, it also, they also mentioned that the um bison that they were hunting they like the female bison the cows would lead like the rest of the herd would like follow the female cows so the cows and calves would go forward and they would like follow them and i was like oh that's so cool but then they ended up like leading them off the cliff and killing them all so i was like that's kind of unfortunate but it is still kind of cool that even this animal that they not necessarily worship, but they like revered in a sense. Mm-hmm. Like it was their lively, they- it was their life source, basically. Yeah. Wow. So I thought that was interesting, and I wanted to see if you guys knew that. I did not know that. I no, I had no idea. But that's super cool. We didn't yeah. even know what the buffalo jump was prior to this episode, <laughs> before our discussion, before we started. So we've just learned so much today. I love that. Yeah. It was really, really cool. And they like the building for Head Smashed In, um, like for the museum part, was built into the hill. Like you can hardly see it from the road. It was so cool. Wow. I love that. Yeah. And then that's um, so we cool. Sh- yeah. We showed up and there was like um, dancing and drumming. They have oh, every Wednesday that. at 11 and 1 30. And so we got to see some of that and it was so cool. Wow. That's amazing. So, mm-hmm, if you're ever Thank in you. Southern Alberta, check that out. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my fun fact. Um, Rebecca, where can people find us? People can find us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook, all at What the Forensics. Um, you could also find all of the source images and sources and reading recommendations that we spoke about throughout our episode on our website, which is whatthefrensics.ca. Um, and it's also here 
that you can contact us if you have any questions or any episode ideas or you just want to chat about something. Um, but if you don't want to do that through the website, you can just email us directly at whattheforensics at gmail.com. And then finally, we do have a Twitter page. Um, <laughs> Is it still active? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to use – I'm never on Twitter. So. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not, not Twitter anymore. It's X. Oh, oh, gross. They made that change? That's like, they did. Uh, That's a thing did. now. Okay, maybe we well, will, maybe we don't have a Twitter account then. <laughs> also, kind of related, unrelated. Um, the reason I don't use Twitter a lot, did I ever tell you about the harassment I faced on Twitter from this guy named Buffalo Bill? <gasps> yes, yes, you, you did. did. <laughs> I've been called a murder murderer sympathizer. And I just was like, I'm done with Twitter. I don't need oh my that. God, I totally oh. forgot about that. Yeah. I was added to like this group of like, I love serial killers. And like, it was just people that he was adding who were like, said something related to and i was literally talking about amanda knox like the amanda knox case and just that the forensic investigation was not conducted well like that's literally all i said and he's like you stand with the the serial killers and murderers and you love them and all this stuff i was like i'm just gonna delete my account okay (laughs) (laughs) yeah i totally forgot about that yeah so i'm kind of traumatized by twitter so that's also why we aren't well i'm not very active (laughs) honor what the forensics um, honestly though it is so fair to be traumatized from twitter because every oh time God. i go on it now like i don't see anything that people i follow post it is just all ridiculously like right wing yeah and stuff and fighting there's yeah. so mm-hmm. many arguments like you can't even post a picture of a cat without people fighting about it yeah yeah well that's an ugly cat like no one cares no, it's, it's my cat yeah. shut up they're all beautiful <laughs> excuse <Yeah>. me <laughs> but anyways yeah, yeah that's my story <laughs> for the meantime you can find yeah. us on x <laughs> <laughs> at wt forensics pc and as we just said we don't really update that nearly as much as our other stuff um so you maybe reach don't out to us but it will yeah. not be a quick response I yeah, it's not our go-to place for sharing all of our newest news and content, but all the other ones, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, website, or email us, um, you'll get in contact with us in no time and you'll find all of our resources and all the stuff we find interesting and all that jazz. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. All right. And um, make sure to give us a review wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd love to read them and give us a rating that keeps us relevant. And with that being said, this has been another episode of What the Forensics. We hope you enjoyed it, and we will see you next time. Bye! Bye. (laughs) Just a reminder to everyone that we are not professionals in the forensic science field. We are just interested in forensics and want to share what we are learning with our listeners. We're trying to give you the most accurate information, but we are human and can make mistakes. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope to see you next week. Mm